James Sasser is in his auto parts store in the town of Pahokee, Florida. It's a typical spring day in this little farming community. The humidity is oppressive, but James has the store's air conditioner cranking. A few customers come and go through the glass doors, and then one of his regulars comes in. She owns a small used car lot nearby with her husband, so she's a familiar sight to James and the co-worker who was in the store with him. But today she gives them a jolt. They watch as she bounds through the door and up to the counter, dressed in a full clown suit. We were both completely surprised when she came in the store dressed head to toe in this clown outfit with makeup and, and everything. The customer explains the costume away. She says she does parties for kids. Pahokee's a quirky little town and her story makes sense, so James brushes it off. Nothing about it would make you suspicious of anything. It just, well, that's just what she does on the side. No, no big deal. But it was a bigger deal than he thought at the time. On Memorial Day weekend, 1990, James saw the news reports about a clown that showed up at the front door of a Wellington home and shot Marlene Warren in the face. Police were looking at two people as possible suspects. One of them was named Sheila Keen. Eleven days after the murder, James called police to tell them about that spring day when Sheila Keen came into his store dressed as a clown. From the South Florida Sun Sentinel in association with Wondery, this is Felonious Florida, the podcast that leads you into the dark side of the Sunshine State. I'm Emma Kate Austin, along with reporter Tanya Alanez. And this is the conclusion of The Killer Clown of Wellington. On the morning of May 26, 1990, Michael Warren was in a car with two of his friends on his way to a horse race in Miami. He was halfway there when his wife's son, Joey, called with the news that Marlene had been shot. With his wife clinging to life, Michael turned around and headed straight for the hospital. He wasn't there for very long before the glare of investigators turned his way. An anonymous call came into police within two hours of the shooting, telling them to ask Michael Warren a few questions. Michael and the young woman he was having an affair with, Sheila Keene. Just months before Marlene's murder, Sheila left her husband and her relationship with her boss was heating up. She worked on his used car lot, a tough and fearless repo woman known to carry a gun. Not what you'd expect for somebody who grew up in a little community known as America's sweetest town. She came from Clewiston in Florida's Heartland region, where she grew up in a close-knit family. The town is on the southwest shore of giant Lake Okeechobee. It's bordered by sugar plantations, and that's where it gets its sweet nickname. Sheila's dad, Robert, owned a construction company in nearby Indian Town, an agricultural community in the middle of the state. She was headstrong, a striking brunette who attracted a lot of boys. An ex-boyfriend said Sheila loved country music dancing and nothing more than hopping into a four-wheel drive for a trek through mud and woods. Another man who dated Sheila said, quote, she was a pretty girl and she stood out. It was her long brown hair. A former classmate said it made her kind of a Crystal Gale type. Sheila was an average student who chose to enroll in adult education rather than attend her final year of high school. And she had brushes with the law. In 1984, when Sheila was 21, she was charged with shoplifting $77.60 worth of merchandise in Palm Beach County. A couple of years later, police in Margate, Florida, arrested her on a misdemeanor theft charge. She pleaded guilty and was sentenced to six months of probation. Sheila got pregnant when she was 23 years old. Six months in, she married the baby's father, Richard Keene, in front of a notary. It was May 13, 1987. The two met when Sheila was in high school and Richard was dating her cousin. Sheila set her sights on him and kind of stole him away, her mother said. Richard was 18 years older than Sheila and a convicted felon. He had a reputation as a troublemaker and a busybody. According to news reports, Richard was a former director of the United Clans of America, one of the largest white supremacist organizations in the country. And he had a hand in organizing in Florida for the presidential campaign of George Wallace, a staunch opponent of the civil rights movement. In 1981, Richard was sentenced to 10 years in prison for marijuana trafficking after he was involved in a shootout with authorities on a rural airstrip in Georgia. Three months into their marriage, in August 1987, Sheila gave birth to their son, Charles Allen Keene. The family of three lived in a small apartment in front of a Pahokee trailer park owned by Richard's parents. Sheila and Richard helped run the park and a neighboring used car lot. They also got into the car repossession business. And that's when the worlds of Michael Warren and Sheila Keene collided, on the lot of Michael's used car dealership, Bargain Motors. By January 1990, Sheila split up with Richard, and her affair with Michael was in full swing. After shooting Marlene Warren on her doorstep on May 26, 1990, 
the killer dressed as a clown casually strolled back to the Chrysler LeBaron it arrived in and drove off. But police were on the trail almost immediately. An anonymous tip focused their attention on Marlene's husband, Michael, and the repo woman from his lot, Sheila Keen. With Marlene on life support at nearby Palms West Hospital, a detective approached Michael and asked him questions about the shooting. Michael was quick to say he had, quote, no idea who would do this to his wife. He was on his way to watch a horse race in Miami as the bullet was being fired. He suggested to the detective that perhaps it was a grudge shooting committed by an evicted tenant. Michael and Marlene owned 17 rental properties in a rough part of Palm Beach County, and Marlene managed them. That meant having to collect rent and evict tenants who couldn't pay. And what about the clown's getaway car, the white LeBaron that had no license plate? Michael said he didn't know anyone who owned a car like that, and he only dealt in Chevrolets at Bargain Motors. But one of Michael's biggest competitors, Pay Less Rent a Car, did deal with Chrysler's. And just 12 hours after Marlene was shot, another anonymous tip came into police. The caller said that a white Chrysler LeBaron had been stolen from Payless just two weeks earlier in a case that was linked to Bargain Motors. A couple visiting from out of town had rented a LeBaron from Payless, a lot in West Palm Beach not far from Michael Warren's Bargain Motors. They called the number they found on an ad in a telephone book to get instructions for how to return the car, but they unknowingly called Bargain Motors instead. The person who answered the call told the couple to leave the car outside the gate to Payless, with the keys in the sun visor. Detective Paige McCann said that's what they did. Uh, the question of the Baron was, um, was a rental car from a Payless rental car, which was a different business from uh, Mike Warren's business, which was Bargain Motors. Um, the people who uh, had rented the car had seen an ad in the newspaper, and they went to uh, try to return the car early. Uh, Michael Warren's business had, a, um, had Payless in his ad as well, so the people became confused and called the number, thinking it was Payless, but it was actually Bargain Motors. And somebody at Bargain Motors answered the phone and told them to leave the car and to leave the keys there. They did so. Later that night, the couple had second thoughts about leaving the keys in the car, so they returned to Payless and the LeBaron was gone. Police discovered that Payless had recently sued Bargain Motors over the phone book ad. It was titled Pay Less, combined into one word. In smaller letters was written, A Bargain Auto Rentals. The Payless lawsuit said the Bargain Motors ad was deceptive, and Bargain was ordered to pay $35,000. An employee at Bargain told detectives that Michael stole three cars as, quote, payback for the lawsuit, and the LeBaron was one of them. The investigation was moving fast, not even a day had gone by since the shooting, and police already had a lead on the clown's getaway car. They also got leads on the flowers and balloons that were delivered to Marlene. And on a clown suit. Just before 9.30 that morning, less than 90 minutes before the shooting, a woman went into a Publix grocery store to purchase flowers and balloons. Two clerks remember selling her a Memorial Day arrangement, white and red carnations in a white basket. She also bought two foil balloons. One of the balloons said, You're the greatest just like the one the clown delivered to Marlene's door. The employees described the woman as kind of tall and thin with brown hair. She wore a white painter's cap and gloves and paid with a $100 bill. The grocery store was about a half mile from Sheila Keene's apartment. Then, an hour after the public's employees called police about the flowers and balloons, the owner of a costume shop called in a tip about a clown suit. On Thursday, two days before the murder, a woman phoned Spotlight Capizio, a costume store on South Dixie Highway in West Palm Beach. She wanted to know if they sold clown costumes. They did and at 6 p.m., the customer showed up. Two clerks were locking the doors, but she convinced them to let her in. She promised to be quick. The clerks remembered her having a long, brown ponytail, and she wore no makeup. She was, quote, very unisex and masculine in the way she walked and talked. The customer chose the cheapest clown costume in stock. It was a candy pink and yellow suit with an orange wig and red foam nose. She told them a woman would be wearing the costume, and she also needed extra white paint, enough to cover an entire face. It cost $36.50. She paid for it with two $20 bills she pulled from her pocket and left with the costume. Within days of the murder, the Publix clerks who sold the flowers and balloons and the costume store employees who sold the clown suit all picked Sheila Keen's picture out of a photo lineup. The bullet from the clown's gun hit Marlene Warren at point-blank range just above her upper lip. It traveled into the back of her head and lodged in her C2 vertebra. She was brain dead on arrival at the hospital, but machines were keeping her alive. Marlene's mother, Shirley Twing, said doctors told her they had no hope. I went in there and told them to take the, pull the plug. Okay? I didn't want my daughter to just lay there and not, not knowing, and knowing that she, she'll never be normal, and that she won't even wake up because of her brain. The brain uh, was uh, shattered, so there's no... No way, so I figured, let her go. That was hard. But knowing that she 
just lay there and can't move, do nothing, or brain's not functioning. So that was my decision to, to pull the plug. Okay, it's kind of hard, but it's it, every time I think about it, somebody coming up and shooting her in the face. All her uh, uh, all her vital organs were given to somebody else. She had that written on her uh, her uh, driver's license. Marlene died at age 40 on Memorial Day, May 28, 1990, two days after the clown shot her. Other than nurses, nobody was at her bedside when she died. By then, Michael Warren and Sheila Keene were already at the center of the murder investigation. Marlene's mother told police of the problems in her daughter's marriage. In fact, she said she told them that her daughter was afraid of Michael. Matter of fact, one time she came home because he apparently threatened her uh, with the boys before Johnny was, uh, was killed. And then he talked her into going back. About six or eight weeks before the shooting, Jamie Marie Twing had what would be her last conversation with her stepsister Marlene. Jamie knew her sister and brother-in-law fought, but as they talked, Marlene hinted at a darker shadow over her marriage. Marlene told her sister, if anything happens to me, get Joey out. She told another sister, Julie, that she was going to get a divorce. The affair between Michael and Sheila had bubbled to the surface of the murder case. And since nearly everything the Warrens owned, Bargain Motors, the lavish Wellington house, all the rental properties, were in Marlene's name, police were on to a possible motive. Marlene's sister, Deborah Raker, found out a day or two before the shooting about Michael's affair. Marlene told her during a phone conversation that she confronted Michael and told him she wasn't putting up with him anymore. Deborah said Michael beat her sister up about a year earlier, and Marlene threatened to leave. Michael allegedly told Marlene he would kill her if she tried to. Even Joey Ahrens, who was home the day the clown shot his mother, told investigators that about three to five days before the shooting, she had threatened to leave Michael, quote, if he did not straighten up. Michael was never home, and Marlene was depressed. She contemplated what to do with the rest of her life and dreamed of a normal marriage with a husband who was home nights and weekends. But that was a boring life to Michael. One by one, the people who knew the Warrens and Sheila Keene pieced together the story of three lives lurching toward disaster. There was Marlene's nephew, Ronald Willosian, who lived with the Warrens for half a year in 1988. He said the two didn't get along and that Michael, quote, ran around with other women a lot. And Janie Fitton, the girlfriend of a Bargain Motors employee, said Michael told her he would never divorce Marlene because she would take all of his money. One of Michael's cousins, Bobby Joe Carter, said Michael treated his wife like dirt, and he saw Marlene crying and upset in the past. So did Marlene's friend Mary Muma, who saw a sullen, miserable Marlene when the two had lunch together three days before the shooting. Marlene confided in Mary that she no longer had a sex life with Michael, and that she believed he was having an affair with Sheila Keene. In fact, just before the visit from the killer clown, Marlene was making plans to take her son with her to Michigan. The Warrens' deteriorating marriage and Michael's affair with Sheila were at the center of the homicide investigation. But Marlene wasn't even buried when a more substantial break in the case was made in the parking lot of a grocery store. It's the day before Marlene's funeral. A car sits in a spot in the parking lot of a shopping plaza in Royal Palm Beach, less than eight miles northeast of the Warren home. An employee of the Winn-Dixie grocery store at the shopping plaza knows the car's been there since at least 4 a.m. two days earlier. It hasn't been moved, and nobody has been seen near it. She believes it's been abandoned, and calls police. It's a white Chrysler LeBaron, and police trace it to pay less rent-a-car, and discover it had been reported stolen weeks earlier. So detectives tow it to police headquarters and call Payless for permission to search it. Within two hours, investigators are combing through it. Jim DiPaolo was a reporter for the South Florida Sun Sentinel who covered the murder and the early days of the investigation. I still can remember to this day where that car was parked in the parking lot and having all the police around it with the police tape, you know, do not cry, you know, do not cross kind of crime scene tape and seeing it out all there and then working for hours in the sun in that searing heat in the sun, working on the fingerprints and everything on that car before they towed it away to see what was going on. During their search, police find cruelly orange fibers on the front passenger seat, possibly from a wig. There are more in the back seat and inside the driver's door. For detectives, that confirms it. The killer clown's getaway car has been found. And along with the orange fibers, police also discover several strands of long brown hair. 
Within hours of the discovery of the LeBaron, investigators were at Sheila Keene's apartment, armed with a search warrant. Just a few days earlier, Sheila was denying everything, about having an affair with Michael, about ever owning or dressing up in a clown costume, about buying flowers or balloons, and about the murder of Marlene Warren. She said she had been out repossessing cars on the day of the shooting, but couldn't recall any of the addresses she'd visited. Later, after police knocked on her door with a search warrant, she clammed up. She told detectives, quote, If you, meaning the police, think I am a suspect, then I wish to have a lawyer. They scoured the place, including a child's bedroom where her son stayed. Charles was a few months from his third birthday and spent time at Sheila's apartment, even though he mostly stayed with his father, Richard Keene. From her apartment, police took away shoes, t-shirts, and jackets, as well as a hairbrush, a bathroom trash bag, and a full vacuum cleaner bag. They also found synthetic orange fibers. The next day, police watched from a van as Marlene Warren was laid to rest. One detective conducted video surveillance while an agent from the Organized Crime Bureau photographed funeral guests with a 35mm camera. The heat was on. So by the day of the funeral, Michael Warren also had stopped talking to police. And he had hired an attorney, John S. Wilbur. As the murder investigation entered its second week, its high-speed pace wasn't letting up. On June 5th, a red foam nose was turned into police by a Royal Palm Beach man named Ray Gregory. Although police have never given details about how and where it was found, they believed it was the nose worn by Marlene's killer. It had a hair on it, but tests in 1990 didn't produce a DNA profile. And then there was the bullet the clown fired into Marlene's face. During her autopsy, it had been removed from her neck and examined by ballistics experts. What turned up was a curious, possible link to a gun Sheila had recently been looking for. The bullet was either a 38 or 357 caliber, possibly shot from a Remington, a make less common than the popular Colt or Smith & Wesson models. For detectives, that revelation was significant. Sheila reportedly owned an obscure brand of a 38 caliber revolver. Richard Keene told police Sheila had called him about a month before Marlene's murder, asking if he'd seen that misplaced gun. Around the same time, Sheila also asked her mother about it. Mary Sheltra told police that Sheila had called to ask her to search her house in Indiantown for the missing gun. It wasn't there. Detectives were amassing a pile of circumstantial evidence in Marlene's murder case. The stolen getaway car with the orange wig fibers. The store clerks who said they sold Sheila flowers, balloons, and a clown suit. The alarming conversations Michael allegedly had with family and associates. The gun. The Warren's finances and the affair between Michael and Sheila. But there were few, if any, physical clues that could link anybody to Marlene's murder. Still, there was a crime they were closing in on, and it was going to send Michael Warren to prison for years. Among the earliest hints that Michael was breaking the law at his car lot came just a day after the clown shooting. A sergeant from the West Palm Beach Police Department called sheriff's investigators to tell them that Bargain Motors had been under surveillance. There were rumors of theft and other illicit activities. The police sergeant said Michael was allegedly involved in prostitution, drugs, loan sharking, and dealing in stolen property. Suzanne Gould was the office manager at Bargain Motors, and she told police Michael had been altering the mileage of cars on his lot and falsifying title records. Then there was an air of unprofessionalism that went on, just everything started heading south. I wanted to not be working there anymore because it just got um, uncomfortable. Like I said, I needed the job. I wasn't stupid. I saw things. Police were learning that Michael had been overcharging customers on insurance. He was also rolling back mileage on rental cars to cover warranties and on used cars so he could charge more. And police learned from employees at the lot that Michael was running a chop shop operation. Reports said that in one case, Michael had one of his guys steal a customer's 1989 Camaro from near her house after she gave him a down payment. He had charged her, quote, extremely high payments to insure it. The customer reported the car stolen, and Michael later collected the insurance check and deposited it into Bargain Motors' bank account. In July, two months after the shooting, police went to Bargain Motors to serve a subpoena on one of Michael's employees. The employee didn't appear to be there, but others in the office told police he was. He was hiding in a closet with Michael Warren. So officers knocked. And they knocked. For 15 minutes. The police report said that when the two finally came out, Michael was combative and verbally abusive to the officers. Three months later, the investigation of Bargain Motors came to a head when police swarmed the lot in a surprise nighttime raid. On October 25, 1990, an arrest warrant was issued for Michael Warren and two of his employees, 21-year-old twins Ronald and Donald Carter. Investigators raided Bargain Motors that night. They took away filing cabinets filled with business transactions and combed the car lot looking for evidence of stolen vehicles. They arrested Ronald Carter at the lot, but his brother wasn't there. Neither was Michael. But the next day, he turned himself in at the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. 
the state charged him with 66 felonies on counts of racketeering, grand theft, conspiring to commit grand theft, operating a chop shop, and dealing in stolen property. When it came to the business and doing and dealing with Michael Warren, then I, I just wanted to keep myself separate from that because I had seen enough to know that the more you know, the worse off you'll probably be. I ended up in that situation, and I tried to keep my eyes um, fixed on a wall rather than, you know, looking around. But I did look around. <laughs> not an idiot. So there was there was activity going on that I will not discuss. It's just like I'm working in a cesspool, and I don't really want to know anybody here. At Michael's bond hearing on October 27th, prosecutors said that Michael was possibly a suspect in Marlene's murder. Prosecutor Alan Giese told the court, quote, We have strong information that links the defendant as a possible suspect in the murder of his wife, Marlene Warren. Michael stayed behind bars for three days until his mother, Joyce Clayton, put her home up as collateral for a $25,000 reduced bail, and he was released. With his case starting its slow drag through the court system, Michael was free to resume his relationship with Sheila Keene. And they did so in spectacular fashion. In January 1991, Marlene Warren had been dead for seven months. And Michael and Sheila were on vacation in the Bahamas. A couple who was also vacationing in the islands was having dinner at Crystal Palace Hotel. It was a sprawling beachfront resort and casino nestled among other posh hotels on the turquoise blue waters of Nassau's North Shore. At the table next to them sat Michael Warren and Sheila Keen. The couple told police that the two were acting strangely and Sheila seemed worried about where to sit. But Michael was all talk. He bragged about the suite he and Sheila were staying in and about the money he was spending in the casino. He told them he had dropped and lost more than $100,000. A detective confirmed their story. He discovered that Michael and Sheila had stayed at the resort between January 17th and 19th, 1991. They didn't have to pay for the room. Because they were frequent gamblers, the hotel gave it to them complimentary. By May 1991, a year had gone by since Marlene Warren's murder, and the investigation was at a frustrating stagnation. A detective working the murder case said there was enough evidence to make an arrest, but state attorneys were concerned there was not enough physical evidence for a successful prosecution. Just over a year after the murder, the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company paid out the claim on Marlene Warren's death policy. Michael was the sole beneficiary, and he was given a check for $53,357.37. As the months went by and Michael waited for his fraud and racketeering trial, investigators got several tips that he was scheming about how to disappear. They were told he was amassing gold bars that he could quickly convert to cash in case he had to flee the country. He was contacting plastic surgeons in Tampa and San Diego. And he was exploring how to start over with a new identity in Baja, Mexico. But none of that happened, and his trial for felonious activity on his car lot started in July 1992. The charges against Michael were serious and the potential punishment severe. If convicted as charged, he faced a prison sentence of up to 237 years. Over the two-week trial, prosecutors made the case that Michael was duping customers and insurance companies for financial gain. Michael's lawyer, John Wilbur, argued that discrepancies in mileage on car rentals and sales agreements were just the result of sloppy record-keeping at Bargain Motors. The jury of three women and three men deliberated for 18 hours over a three-day period. On August 7, 1992, 40-year-old Michael Warren sat sullen as the verdicts were read. Guilty on one count of racketeering, 21 counts of odometer fraud, 11 counts of grand theft, and 10 counts of petty theft. He turned himself into police that evening. The sentencing hearing happened on November 11, 1992. Michael was facing a lengthy prison term, but the judge surprised everyone with a dramatic decision and a severe admonishment of the state attorneys. The judge sentenced Michael to 22 years of probation, no prison time. Then he ripped into prosecutors. Palm Beach County Circuit Court Judge Walter Colbath Jr. said if Michael Warren's wife had not been the victim of the so-called clown murder, he never would have been tried for racketeering. If you have evidence to charge Michael with killing his wife, Judge Colbath told prosecutors, then, quote, get on with it. The state attorneys brushed off the judge's comments and appealed the sentence. While they did, Michael posted a $75,000 bond and was released. For the 18 months the appeal took, little is known about where Michael Warren and Sheila Keene were, or what they were doing. But finally, on March 24, 1994, Michael was stripped of his freedom when an appeals court tossed out his sentence. Michael's new sentence was nine years in a Florida state prison. His term would start one week later. But first, it was party time for Michael and a girlfriend he introduced as Debbie. Here's reporter Tanya Alanez. 
Before Michael went off to prison, his um, friends in South Florida threw him a going away party. And um, one of the people who was at that party, his name is Gerald Mullins, and he lives in Virginia now. He um, talked to police and said that um, that was the last time he saw Michael. So it was kind of, um, you know, around spring of 94. And he attended that party. And um, he said he'd never met anyone named Sheila, but that at this party, Michael's girlfriend, Debbie, was there. And she's a long, brown-haired brunette. And the plan was that she was going to manage the restaurant that Michael had recently bought in Tennessee while Michael was locked up. And um, that was the last time Gerald remembers seeing Mike or his girlfriend, Debbie. On Thursday, March 31st, 1994, Michael Warren was behind bars. Michael served out his prison time in South Florida the majority in a minimum security work camp in Homestead, south of Miami. He worked there as an orderly and a laborer for the state transportation department. His prison record was spotless, and after four years, he was released early for good behavior. On New Year's Eve 1997, Michael walked out of prison and into a fresh new life. He gave the corrections department his mother's address as his residence, 3200 South Ocean Drive, in a building bordered on two sides by water in exclusive Palm Beach, Florida. But whether he ever stayed there isn't known, in fact, Michael's footsteps for the next two decades are difficult to trace. And the investigation into Marlene Warren's bizarre murder went ice cold. While Michael's new life after prison was mostly a mystery, there are a few clues. One is a 2002 document that homicide detectives in Florida wouldn't learn about for 12 years. It's a marriage certificate. On August 15, 2002, just over a dozen years after his wife's murder, Michael remarried. And his Las Vegas bride was Sheila Keene. On the certificate, Michael and Sheila Warren reported they were making their home in eastern Tennessee. Meanwhile, in Florida, reporter Jim DePaula says there was virtually no movement in the investigation into Marlene Warren's murder. You know, we follow and follow and follow, and then after a while, the leads just kind of dried up. We found out, you know, about Michael's previous arrest record. There was no proof about Sheila and Michael actually having an affair. And then on top of it, whether that, that had anything to do with Marlene's murder, uh, all of that was just... You could take it so far, but then after that, it became a dead end. And it, and it became a dead end to the police, too, the, the investigators. Um, they did everything they could at the time. After a while, there just wasn't really a lot to talk about. There were a few tips, but mostly dead ends. In one tip, an anonymous caller on June 27, 2000, said he knew the location of the murder weapon and part of the clown costume. Police traced the call to Donald Carter, one of Michael's twin cousins who worked on his car lot, Bargain Motors. In a sworn statement, Donald said that one day, Michael gave him a gun to hide he put it in the attic of his parents' home. He also said he was given a clown wig to get rid of. It was wrapped in spark plug wire so it would sink in water. Donald said he threw the wig into a canal off Military Trail in West Palm Beach. Detectives didn't find the gun in the attic, and divers searched the canal for the wig with no luck. Two years later, in late 2002, police in Virginia contacted the sheriff's office in Palm Beach County about an investigation they were conducting into drug trafficking. The drug investigation was unrelated to the Wellington Killer clown case, but it did come up in discussions between Virginia and Florida detectives. Michael Warren's name came up too, but the investigation produced no leads in the murder case. To Jim DePaula, it seemed interest in the case had dried up. Being a crime reporter for 18 years, well, usually what you would see is when family members had an unsolved murder in their family, they were always going to the police. And the police always made an effort to like maybe have a year anniversary, five-year anniversary, 10-year anniversaries needed to remind the public, hey, we're still trying to solve this crime. But that never really happened in Marlene's case. Everybody just kind of, it kind of just, kind of just kind of withered on the vine, if, if I could say it that way. But late in 2013, the investigation was given new life. Long brown hairs, orange fibers, and new technology broke the case wide open and sent cold case detectives into the mountains of Tennessee and Virginia. It started with a $125,000 grant from the federal government. Investigators from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office used it to form a task force aimed at, once and for all, closing the case of the killer clown of Wellington. The team took a fresh look at evidence that had been collected two decades earlier. The focus was on fibers and hairs that had been found in the clown's getaway car, as well as the samples of Sheila Keene's hair that had been collected during the 1990 search of her apartment. They also had hair and blood samples Sheila had provided and a strand of long brown hair that was found tangled in the ribbons attached to the clown's balloon delivery on the day of the murder. DNA tests had been done decades earlier but were not conclusive. With advances in DNA technology, the lead detective ordered new tests by an FBI lab. Investigators also tracked down witnesses for new rounds of questioning. One of them was an employee of Michael's named Claude Poitras, and he had stunning information about the getaway car. But he was in Canada because he was afraid for his life.
Claude worked at Bargain Motors for three or four years and admitted to police that he was involved in the odometer tampering that sent Michael to prison. And he sealed the story about the stolen Chrysler LeBaron. He said he was with Michael and Sheila when they drove to the Payless car lot. And um, he watched Michael get into the car and take the keys out of the sun visor and start it up and drive away. Claude said he and Sheila followed four ways and then they pulled over and Sheila got out and joined Michael and the LeBaron. They went off and Claude returned to the um, bargain motors. He told police that a few weeks after the clown's getaway car was found, Michael told him to, quote, never say anything about the Chrysler LeBaron to anybody. When Michael stepped up the pressure on Claude, he began to feel in danger. I believe it's in early 1991 when Claude, he gets a subpoena from the um, state attorney's office to come in and speak to investigators. And as soon as Michael found out that Claude had gotten subpoenaed, he started calling Claude every day, multiple times a day. And um, Claude was feeling more and more uneasy. Um, other workers at the car lot said he was getting very nervous. In fact, he quit his job um, at the car lot and was waiting tables at an Italian restaurant nearby. And um, when he did give a statement to police in February of 91, he had plans to, in fact, leave the country and go back to Canada, where he was from, immediately after the interview. Um, he told um, police that he was afraid Michael would kill him or his girlfriend if Michael found out that Claude was talking to police. And that was a quote from a police report. If Claude's story was credible, he put Sheila and Michael right in the clown's getaway car. So in October 2014, Florida detectives flew to Montreal and convinced Claude to cooperate with the investigation. Suddenly, Marlene's murder case was picking up steam. On an early fall evening in September 2017, Michael Warren and his wife Sheila are on the road, driving back from a visit to see her mother in Vermont. They're just a few minutes from their home in tiny, historic Abingdon, Virginia. But here in Abingdon, no one knows Sheila. To them, she's Debbie. Up until last spring, Mike and Debbie Warren poured their all into a popular little fast food drive through called the Purple Cow, just across the border in Tennessee. It's along busy Lee Highway, in a long but narrow building with a giant hamburger on the roof and four life-size cows out front. The Warrens are hard workers. For at least a decade and a half, they pulled six-day work weeks to make the burger joint a success. Their hours were so long that they spent more nights at the nearby home Sheila owned in a quiet suburban cul-de-sac than in Abingdon at their grand lakefront mansion 45 minutes away. Abingdon is tucked in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's a quaint town where the oldest building dates back to 1779, and its main street is quintessential USA. Brick storefronts line the main street. There are antique stores, a soda shop that spells it S-H-O-P-P-E, and the opulent Martha Washington Inn. And now that the Warrens had sold the Purple Cow, they're relaxing into retirement in the comforts of the steepled home they had custom-built in 2002. It's a massive house with a steep, circular driveway, concrete fountain, and a boat dock out front. There are about two dozen equally lavish homes in the tight-knit Heron Point development. This is a community where neighbors buzz around on golf carts and stop to chat when they see each other. Here, Mike and Debbie are a warm, quick-to-laugh, inseparable couple. They even share a Facebook page. Their next-door neighbors are their best friends, and together they celebrate birthdays, holidays, the advent of summer. Mike and Debbie love throwing parties for friends, often on their dock in front of their house. Other times they throw viewing parties in their basement, where they have a movie-watching room filled with collector pinball machines. Nobody who knows the Warrens here in Abingdon has a clue that either had been married before. They don't know they came from Florida, that Mike had spent time in prison, or that Debbie's real name is Sheila Keene. But on this little country road on their way back from Vermont, Mike and Debbie's past is about to catch up with them. They're winding through the hills in their black Cadillac SUV. It's evening, around 5.30, and they're about five minutes from home when a police car swings in behind them. They pull over at a dusty opening on the narrow country road. Michael is behind the wheel, and a deputy from the Washington County Sheriff's Office approaches his window. But he's here for Sheila, Sheila Keene Warren and they have a warrant for her arrest. Startled and shaken, Sheila gets out of the SUV. Michael, now 65, can only watch as his wife is handcuffed and put in the back of a patrol car. Sheila asks the deputy in the car if she's under arrest. Lieutenant Dewey Fulton answers, yes. Sheila has another question, but it's not about what she's under arrest for. She only wants to know, quote, is my husband under arrest? Lieutenant Fulton answers, not yet. Finally, in an interview room at the sheriff's office, an investigator asks Sheila if she wants to know why she's being charged. When he tells her it's for the 1990 murder of Marlene Warren, Sheila Keene says she doesn't want to talk and puts her head down on the table. The state attorney made the announcement. 
uh, Ms. Uh, Sheila Keen Warren has been indicted for first degree murder with a firearm. The potential penalty in this case is life in prison and potentially the death penalty. Despite a mountain of circumstantial evidence that began to pile up within hours of the shooting, what was missing for almost three decades was physical evidence that directly tied anybody to the murder. Palm Beach County Sheriff Rick Bradshaw said investigators couldn't make a move against Sheila until they were certain they would only get one chance at a conviction. There's one thing to think somebody did something. There's another thing to know that they did it and be able to prove it in court. We want to make sure we got the right person, because if we don't have the right person, number one, we don't want to put an innocent person in jail, but number two, the real perpetrator is still out there, and we don't want that to happen. What finally put Sheila Keene in handcuffs were hair and blood samples collected decades earlier. The new round of DNA tests ordered by lead detective Paige McCann paid off. I mean, cold cases, we, kind of, we have a big puzzle, and some of the pieces are already filled in, and a lot of it was already filled in by the uh, thorough investigation done by the initial detectives. Um, we just needed a few of those little pieces of the puzzle, and we were able to uh, do that um, with DNA, the new technologies and DNA, and we were able to complete the puzzle. And I think that's what led to the indictment. The arrest after so many years took Florida and Marlene's family by surprise. The accused killer clown had been unmasked. It was news Marlene's mother, Shirley Twing, had been waiting 27 years and four months to hear. I hope, I hope she gets what she deserves. That's all I can say. Then baby, I can rest. As Sheila Keene sits in jail awaiting trial, many questions remain today. Undoubtedly, one of the biggest among them is what role, if any, Michael Warren played in his wife's murder. The potential motives are hard to ignore. The affair, a five-figure insurance payment, full ownership of the couple's properties, including the car dealership, the lavish Wellington home, the 17 rental properties. Records indeed show that investigators considered Michael a suspect early in the investigation of his wife's murder. But today, late in October 2018, Police and prosecutors will only give one answer to the question of his involvement. The case is still ongoing, and um, we will definitely work diligently to determine if anyone else was involved. Sheila's lawyer, Richard Lubin, insists police arrested the wrong person. A case that lingered for this long without an arrest was, was obviously uh, not a slam dunk, like they knew who did it from the very beginning. Lubin says that not only is there no physical evidence against Sheila, even the clown's gender is not known for certain. Marlene's son, Joey, and his girlfriend saw the clown that day in 1990, and both told police they believed it was a man. But within two months of the murder, police were convinced the clown was a woman, though they have never said how they were so certain. The question will likely come up at Sheila's trial. Was the clown a man or a woman? On Friday, October 6, 2017, Sheila Keene Warren pleaded not guilty to the murder of Marlene Warren. Prosecutors announced they will pursue the death penalty against her. Michael Warren remained in Abingdon, Virginia, where he currently lives alone in his lakeside mansion. The South Florida Sun Sentinel will continue to cover Sheila's trial as well as any new developments in the Killer Clown case. Felonious Florida will bring you updates through social media, our newsletter, and bonus episodes. You can sign up at feloniousflorida.com. Thank you for listening to the conclusion of The Killer Clown of Wellington and the season two finale of Felonious Florida. If you're enjoying the podcast and want to keep hearing new seasons, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about our show. It's available online at feloniousflorida.com, Apple Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to take advantage of the offers from our show's sponsors. You can find them in the show notes by tapping or swiping over the cover art. Their support makes the show possible. Go online to see photographs, video, and read more about the cases we're featuring at feloniousflorida.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Polonius Florida is produced by the South Florida Sun Sentinel and Wondery. The Killer Clown of Wellington was reported and written by Tanya Alanez and Mark Freeman, with additional reporting by Brianna Erickson in Las Vegas. And I'm your host and sound designer, Emma Kate Austin. Our producers are David Schutz and Juan Ortega. Editing by Randy Roguski. Sound direction by Sean Pitts, with additional recordings by Carlene Jean and Amy Beth Bennett. The Felonious Florida team includes Lisa Arthur, Dana Banker, Yaron Zhu, Danny Sanchez, and Kelly Fry. Hi, this is Tanya Alanez. Local journalism matters. Support us by joining the Sun Sentinel, South Florida's leading source for news, information, and entertainment. Visit sunsentinel.com slash join.